But first, just a little announcement. You notice that we're computer free today. Doesn't it feel freeing? <laughs> like we're not tied to something. Well, you are tied to something. You're tied to the paper in front of you. So all of the songs and the litany and everything that we do today will be in your bulletin. Uh, so feel free to look at it as much or as little as you'd like. And we're going to move through our service. A reminder that today after the service, we're going to have a coffee hour, very short, brief coffee hour, and then we're going to come back up for a quarterly meeting. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, today we are here to worship you, to have our mouths give praise to who you are as God, as Redeemer, as Savior. And Lord, we pray as this time, uh, being a time of, of education and renewal and praise and worship and petition, that Lord, that you command all of our attention. We ask in a very intentional way that those things that take our mind and our focus into a million different directions just cease for a little bit so that we can praise you and hear you so that you can speak through us and use us, Lord. And Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to descend upon us, to move about the room, to usher us in to your kingdom and into a time of praise, we pray. Amen. morning. So again, for those who just came in with no PowerPoint today, we'll be following along in the bulletins. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. They speak of the glorious splendor of his majesty, and we will meditate on his wonderful works. We will celebrate his abundant goodness and joyfully sing of his righteousness. Please take your hymn books and we'll stand and sing hymn number 262, Holy, Holy, Holy.
you may be seated. We've been going through the book of Samuel, and we talked about the dedication of um, Samuel in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the house of the Lord in Shiloh with Hannah and Elkanah. As American Baptist, we participate in baby dedication, and the difference between the dedication and a baptism is as American Baptists, we believe that children or adults should come to the recognition of baptism on their own. And so we um, participate in what's called believer's baptism. But what we do for our children or babies is we dedicate them. And what we do is in the tradition of Hannah is we take them to church we don't leave them there, which is what Hannah did once uh, he was weaned. But we, we promise to raise them in the Lord, and that's what we're going to do today. So I'll invite all of our family up. My dad's going to lead us in part of it. All of you guys up. Raina, you want to come up here? The one time we want Raina up here. <laughs> right? When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do he what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah? told her, stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the, may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This part is for the parents. Do you dedicate yourselves as parents? Bring up Soren in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Thank you. Do you promise to instruct him in the Bible and in the practice of prayer to guide him in the development of a Christ-like character and do note to diligently bring him into the services of the church where he will be taught in the Christian way of life? We do. Do you promise to try to, to the best of your ability, to so shape the home life of your child by family devotions, by your words, by your example, that he will at the proper age be able to come to an open confession of Christ? We do. Now this is to the congregation. Will you agree to commit to setting a good example as well as lovingly praying for and nurturing this child? Yeah. <laughs> On behalf of these parents and this congregation, I dedicate Soren to God and to the admonition of learning all about him today. And we'll do this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I have a prayer here that we'll pray together. Thank you, Father. 
we worship and honor you, the great giver of life, holy creator, the one who formed each of us in our mother's womb, the inventor of life, who, the inventor who, of life who brings eternal life. Thank you for the gift of Soren. Good Father, fill this family with your presence that this child might grow in a soil saturated with love. Make these parents quick to forgive and quick to confess sin that this child would experience again and again, the grace that belongs to them through Jesus Christ. Empower us as a church to live by the light of the resurrection, the wonder of the empty tomb, that all our children would hope in the risen Christ. Deepen our sense of adventure as this family of God that this child would live courageously for the kingdom of God. So root this dear one in your love that the deep sac in your love that the deep that the deep sacrificial love of Jesus would sink into his bones, that he might live all his days as your beloved child. May he encounter you the Holy God, again and again, and through encounters with you, learn humility. Father of all, we entrust Soren to your care, recognizing that you are the best parent, the shaper of souls, the former of heart, the one we trust to do immeasurably more than we can all ask or imagine through Jesus. Amen. Please stand and open your hymn books to hymn number 44, Children of the Heavenly Father. Continuing Psalm 145, I will exalt you, my God and the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. All your works praise you, Lord. All your faithful people extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom.
faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all will look to you and you have given their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him. 
but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak and praise the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. join together in prayer. Father God, that is our plea, our praise to you, that our voices will ring out forever and ever in praise and worship of you. Lord, as we dedicated Soren this morning, Lord, we dedicate ourselves, continuing in your service to the community, to the world, to each other, Lord. Bind us together as a body and help us to be your people, your ministers to all around us. Lord, we praise you and thank you through your son, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Out of gratefulness and thankfulness of heart, we'll now collect our morning's tithes and offerings, which go towards the ministry of this church in this community and beyond.
morning in prayer, and we've been um, kind of working through different prayers in here, so I thought today we would pray through our worship. So we're going to pray through the songs that we have already sung. How fun is that? We're going to spend some moments, let's, let's begin with some time of silence, and then um, I'll lead you through this, and then we'll close the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, we have sung that you are holy, holy, holy. We are reminded of the passage in Isaiah when he goes into the throne room and the cherubim and the seraphim are singing just that over and over and over again. And so today, Lord, as we have sung that, remind us that you are holy, that we are not. Remind us not in a place of shame, but a place of purpose and understanding. A place that allows us to know that we worship the God who says he is who he is. The only God that is worthy of our praise. And Father, today as we have sung that you are holy, we have also sung that we would promise to remember what you have done in our lives. That we would testify collectively and individually of those things that you have done so, Fathers, we have sung over and over again that we will remember. Place that on our heart. Write it on our foreheads and through our doorpost. Allow us, as we have said in our psalm, to testify with our mouth. Praises to you. And Lord, as we sing that final line in We Will Remember, that we remember the day that you called out our name, if there are those right now in this service that have not heard that, the Father, we'd ask you to allow their ears to be open to hear you calling to them, that they would have the, the ability to not only to hear, but to respond. Father, we sung that that is, better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. We pray, Father, that those be not just words, that we actually mean it. In our world of distraction with TV and electronics and social media and a million things pulling our eyes away from you, remind us that it is truly better to spend that time in your presence than anywhere else. Give us not just the knowledge, but the ability and the strength to be intentional about that, to take each and every day to spend time with you, to seek out communion and fellowship, and Lord, also to spend time in prayer, praying not only for our needs and for our relationship with you, but for our world, Lord. We take time right now to do just that. We pray for our country in what seems like a time of anxiety and tension. Pray that we are peacemakers. We pray for our world, which is constantly under chaos and destruction, natural disasters, physical disasters, poverty, disease, and death, Lord. Allow it not to overwhelm us, but allow us to seek you in it, to pray for the countries of this world, to pray for ways that we can interact, to be your hands and feet, to be your missionaries globally, locally, and within our own families. And Lord, we sing that salvation belongs to you, and we know that. We know that there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. So give us the grace and the temerity to testify to that, not out of a place of arrogance, but out of a place of knowledge, out of a place of strength, that we are saved by you. That we do not have to live every day as we have. That we have freedom. And Father, today we pray that you would call us to you. That we would hear you in the message in just a few moments. That you would give us clarity and wisdom and grace, Lord. 
And Father, we pray for the, all those things that um, have been lifted up to you in silence. We pray for the healing. We pray for uh, Julia and Chris's little baby today, praying that he'll be able to be released from the hospital and the family will be joined at home. We pray for those right now in our congregation who are suffering, whether it's physical or emotional. We pray for relations to be healed. We pray for wisdom to be given. We pray for reconciliation in our lives and in our families as much as possible, Lord. And for any of those of us today sitting here feeling the grip of fear, we ask you to remind us of the promises in your word. Lord, we ask all these things in your name as we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Samuel, chapter 13, 5 through 15. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped on Michmash, east of beth Aven. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and their ar army was hard-pressed, they hid in the caves and thickets among the rocks and pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of the Gad and the Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days. The time was set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw the men were scattering, and that you did not come at all at the set time, and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command, then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin. And Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. The word of God for the people of God. So we've been working our way through Samuel. And uh, last two weeks ago, when we left, we left the Israelites wanting to be like everybody else. They wanted to solve a human problem with a human solution. They wanted a king. And so God, knowing what the result was going to be, allowed them to have a king. So Saul is anointed with oil by Samuel. And his reign as the first king of Israel starts off swimmingly. He comes into contact with a neighboring tribe, the Ammonites, and the Israelites have this triumphant victory over the Ammonites. And it's all great. 
And then in chapter 12, Samuel gives this scathing rebuke to the Israelites. Now, part of it is kind of a farewell speech, because though Samuel's not necessarily going anywhere just yet, he has a twofold office, and one of them has been replaced by the king. He is to be a priest and a judge. But the people want the king to be the judge. And so he knows this Saul is going to replace that part. So in chapter 12, it's this long rebuke by Samuel to the people of Israel, and he warns them about what happens when you do not obey God. You have a king, but you are always to listen to God. And he says, by the way, that goes for you, Saul. Can't get out of it. Then chapter 13 comes along, and as you heard Joseph read part of it, Saul does something that completely takes away the reign, not only from him, but from his descendants. Remember, one of the things the Israelites wanted a king for was to pass in succession the kingdom into their children. And so Saul's act in chapter 13 takes that away from him. He jumps the gun. He sacrifices when he's not supposed to. He is not obedient to God. And God takes away his reign. Okay. So if we're kind of honest with ourselves, you read chapter 13 and you finish it and you go, I don't really get the big deal. Like, what did he do that was so bad? Well, what happened to do-overs, right? So what if you're a king? Everyone has a bad day. What's so harsh? I mean, think about it. He's got the Philistines breathing down his neck. Samuel is tardy. He's nowhere to be found. And you've got to have a king be a king. Who doesn't want a leader who acts first and then thinks later? God doesn't. Especially if God has told you to be obedient. It's harsh, though. And you read this and you think, my goodness gracious, what in the world did Saul do that was so evil in the eyes of the Lord that he took away his kingdom forever? In short, when we're called to be leaders, when we're called to represent God, as the book of James tells us, we have a very high level of expectation that is placed upon us. God expects us to follow his command. We don't get to go rogue. We don't get to make it up as we see fit. We don't get to decide what to do and then ask God to join us in our battle. You know what the Bible does? The Bible takes our world and it says what you think is important in leadership, what you think is important is power, that is not what God considers powerful. Remember last week, Psalm 147, what God considers favorable is not power. It's humility. It's obedience. It's patience. But that doesn't fly in our world. Could you imagine a leader in our world saying, let me get back to you on that. I'm going to pray about it. I don't know. Let me talk to God because I don't know. We don't want leaders that are weak and humble and obedient to God. We want leaders who are quick on their feet, who are tough, who don't apologize for their behavior. Look at our two highest political candidates right now. The problem with solving a human problem with a human solution is the only answer to the human solution is the one person, fully human, fully divine, who never went rogue, is your answer. And that's Jesus Christ. Christ was obedient from the moment he was born until he died. He never took matters into his own hands. He did exactly what the Father commanded him to do. He knew his role. And that's what we're called to do as well. But see, here's the thing, because this is the part about Christianity I don't always like. What does that mean, though? That we're supposed to be robots? That we're supposed to mindlessly follow God? That we can't have a brain or an opinion or a purpose? What if I don't want to do what God wants me to do? Do I just have to succumb and not even think about it? No. God wouldn't have given you a brain if he didn't intend for you to use it. But being obedient doesn't mean you're stupid. 
Being obedient means you understand that God is in charge, he is in control, and we follow his plans. It means we understand our jobs. It means we understand our purpose in this world. It means that we join him, no matter what it is, at any cost. It means that we get smaller in the eyes of man so that we can be larger in the eyes of God. And that is the difference between the first two kings of Israel. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's hit Saul first. Turn, uh, open up your passages. I want to point out something as we dive into what it means to be obedient and what Saul did wrong. If you look at verse 1 in chapter 13, and we didn't read this verse. Um, In the NIV, which is what I read from, it says, Saul was 30 years old, and when he became king, he reigned over Israel 42 years. That's kind of weird, right? Because you read that and you think, he just got smacked down in chapter 13 at the end of it. So how could he have reigned for 42 years? Doesn't sound like God really took away any kingdom. Actually, it's wrong in the NIV. This is what's called textual criticism. And this is one of those things I point out because oftentimes when people are reading scripture, they'll read through these things and then they'll say, this is why I don't trust the Bible. Because it's just some guy doing some translation, and he messes it up, and so you can't trust anything. Yes, you can trust it. You have to know the translation. So let me go through this very quickly, because the NIV is incorrect in this. The very first verse starts off with, and Saul was son of a year, Ben Shana. And then when he was son of two years, Ben Bet Shana, he appointed an army. This son of, Ben is son, Shana is year. This construction is a noun construct. Of, by the way, is never in the biblical Hebrew. It is implied. So son of however many years, numerical value years, is what's called the regnal formula. It calculates the time, the duration that a king reigned, or it can calculate the age of the king or queen when they begin to reign. So the little bit of the problem with verse 1 is that what's missing is the numerical value. It just says ben shana, and then it says ben bat shana. So when there is no numerical value, you substitute the implication of aleph, which means one. So what this says is, when he served one year, then in the second year, he had to appoint an army. What's the point? Very quickly into his reign, the Israelites come to him and say, we paid you to be a king, and you need to be a king. That's great with the Ammonites, but we've got another person breathing down our neck in the form of the Philistines. The Philistines still have not gotten over that whole ark hemorrhoid thing, right? Which was like so last year, but for whatever reason, they can't let it go. And so they're after the Israelites. And the Israelites are not going to give Saul a honeymoon. We paid you to be a king. Get an army together. Because remember, there is no army prior to the king. It is ad hoc. So he has to get an army together because they know they're either going to be attacked or they need to attack. Saul understands what it means to be in danger. But the thing here is, it is Saul's son, Jonathan, that actually provokes the Philistines. And he picked on the wrong guys. Because the Philistines, chapter 13 tells us in verse 5, have far more troops, far more chariots. They have ten times the chariots that the Israelites have men. They have twice as many horsemen as the Israelites have men. And not only is that bad enough, but then later in chapter 13 we're told the Israelites, they have no weapons. The Philistines have their armory. Jonathan has a spear and Saul has a sword, but that's it. And not only that, it gets worse. The guys who wanted to fight the Philistines are scared to death. And so they've hidden in the mountains. And they're hiding out in the hill country. And so he's got 600 guys, and that's it. From an earthly perspective, he is in a dire situation. But let me pause on that. From an earthly perspective, he's in a dire situation. So what does a leader do? 
a leader makes decisions, and a king has to do something. And Samuel's not around. He said he'd be back in seven days, and it's seven days and 11 hours, and he's nowhere to be found. And so Saul usurps the priesthood, and he becomes king and priest and sacrifices in the place of Samuel. And Samuel gets there, and Samuel says, buddy, you made a mistake. You overstepped your bounds. You got out of your lane. You did something you're not supposed to do. And because of that, God would have kept your kingdom forever. Now he's wiping you out. Ouch. Harsh much? Yes. Yes. If we're going to be the missional people that God has called us to be, that means that we have to be different. It means that when we're leaders, we have to lead differently. It means, as Dale said last week, if we want to see the kingdom of God breaking in, then we have to get out of the way and let God use us to allow it to break in. And it means we have to be faithful. It means that we have to understand that it is not inevitable to look like the leadership of the world and it means that we cannot jump the gun with God. So let's look at what Saul, what Saul did. Number one, it means that we have to be faithful. One of the biggest areas of temptation, one of the ways that Satan will use you and me, is in the area of lack of faith. If there's a lack of faith in any area of our life, that is the one place that will get blown open. And if you're sitting there today and you're saying, don't worry, I got this, because I believe in God. Okay, believe happens up here. It's cerebral. It's cognitive. You can rationalize and intellectualize it. Faith is a leap in the dark. Faith is a whole terrain that the heart and the brain really don't even know how to talk to each other like this. And so if we're going to be faithful then we have to trust God. We have to be faithful to God. It is not enough just to believe in him. Saul, Saul believes in God. He doesn't have faith in God. He doesn't have faith in God because very early in his kingship, when it seems like his back is against the wall, he immediately drops all the defenses, doesn't get on his knees, he makes the decisions, and he freaks out. And the thing is, Saul was never in danger. That's the problem with an earthly perspective, is that an earthly perspective skews it for us, and it makes us think that it is so much worse than it is. Years ago, Mitch and I were hiking in uh, Nicaragua. Some of you have heard this story. I will not repeat the whole thing, Chelsea Judson. Um, but we were, we were hiking in, in Nicaragua in this area called Sava Negra, and it's up in the mountains. There's lots of mountains in Nicaragua. And in Nicaragua, it gets dark at 6 p.m. year-round, doesn't matter what the month is. And we were there in November, so it was the rainy season. So it was getting dark, and it was rainy, and we were lost. Like the road less traveled, we were on the road that had never been traveled. Okay? No cell phone, no GPS, no map, no trail. <laughs> and it's dark, and it's rainy, and they will not find our remains for days. And if they do, they're going to have to have horses go up there. So I, of course, was so calm <laughs> as I'm making my way through the vines and the sticks. No, I wasn't calm at all. I'm thinking some, like, gigantic, rare Nicaraguan snake is going to eat me. Or I kept saying to Mitch over and over again, we're never going to see our grandkids. He's like, Steph, we don't have grandkids. I know, but we're never going to see our grandkids. <laughs> when you have earthly perspective, it is impossible to see the forest for the trees. God has aerial view. God saw us on Savanegra. God knew exactly how to get out of that situation. And that's the same thing with Saul. When you have an earthly perspective, you get overwhelmed. You start making decisions out of anxiety and out of fear and not from God's view. Saul was never in danger, and we know that because the Philistines did not do what the Philistines always did. They did not attack right away. They didn't attack until Jonathan provoked them. And when Samuel shows up, he says to Saul, in essence, look, buddy, this was a test. And you failed big time. What? A test? Yes. He was safe all along. God knew exactly what he was doing. 
It was Samuel that was able to intervene on the behalf of the Israelites and get the Philistines off their back and get the ark back in previous chapters. God was in control, but Saul had no faith in God. When you're in places of temptation, whether it is temptation to be more powerful than we should be, whether it's in temptation to do something we know we shouldn't, if it's a temptation to go rogue, if it's a temptation with an addiction that grips us, whatever it is that we find ourselves in temptation, what we need to ask ourselves in that moment is this. Do I believe that God is really who he says he is? Do I believe it? You can do what I do, which I've said in previous sermons, I'm a salmon, I'm a salmon, I'm a salmon, over and over again to face temptation. But at the end of the day, the question that really should motivate us is, do I believe, do I have faith that God really is who he says he is? Not do I believe God is who I say he is. Do I believe he's who he says he is? Belief in the word of God. When we know the promises in the word of God, man, you can recall those over and over and over again. You know what God says to us? That I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says in Isaiah, when you face fire, oh my goodness, not if you face, when you face, I'll be with you. He says to us in the New Testament, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. Those are the promises over and over and over again that allow us to remain faithful. You know, when Jesus was tempted in the desert in 40 days, and when Satan gets at him, isn't it interesting what Satan tempts Jesus with? Tempts him with power, Right? Wants to see, are you going to cave for approval, or are you going to be obedient to God? And Satan goes to Jesus and he says, if you really are this king, if you really are the son of God, then turn these stones to bread. And what does Jesus say? It is written, it is written, that man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. Every single time Satan tempts Jesus, he answers with the word of God. Jesus knows. He has faith in God. He knows God's not going to starve him in the desert. He knows that God has a plan for him. What the world tells us is not to believe in that. That religion is just a crutch for, for weak people or old people. That you shouldn't believe the miracles of the Bible because they're just myths. That it's easier as a leader to ask for forgiveness than permission. And none of that is true. God is who he says he is. It's our job to be faithful. Secondly, it is our job to understand that as leaders, we do not have to fall to the status quo. It is not inevitable that you have to lead like the world leads. Jesus didn't do it. Didn't lead like the world led. When Samuel shows up, to Saul, he gives him a chance to repent and to confess. And he walks in and he says to Saul, what have you done? And Saul makes up some excuse about how Samuel was late and it's paltry. And then Samuel says, you are foolish in what you did. What have you done? It's this phrase in Hebrew that says, Vakirmir, Shamuel, meh, yasata. Yasa is to make or to do. What have you done, Asata? It's a phrase that is shocking, and it puts the focus on the individual's actions. When God knows that Cain has killed Abel, what have you done? When, when Moses gets off the mountain and he realizes that Aaron's made this golden calf, he says, what have you done? When Joshua realizes that Ahan has plundered Jericho and taken some of the spoils, he says, what have you done? When Abimelech realizes that Abraham's lied about Sarah, he says, what have you done? It is shocking, and it puts the emphasis on Saul. It means, Saul, this is on you. You made the decision. But his back was against the wall. And the Philistines are caving in, and, and people are expecting him to lead. So, so what do you do but make a split-second decision? Think about it. If Saul hadn't done anything, if he'd actually waited, then God would have gotten credit. If he had allowed Samuel to intervene through sacrifice, then Samuel would have gotten credit. 
when we become leaders like the world, we do it because we want the credit. We want to be the answers. We want to be the glory and the power. And God understood better than anybody that that was the temptation of having an earthly king. That they would constantly be tempted to give in to approval of man over the obedience of God. And then lastly, we are not called to jump the gun. We're not called to get ahead of God. When Samuel shows up, he says in uh, verse 13, he says, you acted foolishly. That's what he says to Saul. You acted foolishly. This word foolishly is the word kakal in Hebrew. And it's in the nifal verb stem, which means this. It changes somehow the subject. The word, whatever it is, acts upon the subject and changes it. So when Samuel is saying to him, you acted foolish, what he's saying is, you're not a fool by definition. You're not stupid. You know better. Your actions made you look foolish. And what were his actions? Got ahead of God. He usurped the power. He became the priest and the king, and he acted unjustly. Man, I can confess to this. This is the one thing that I swear God just breaks me of every single year and month and day is this desire to get ahead of God. You know, I feel like that. I feel just like Saul half the time. It's the seventh day, it's the 11th hour, and people are counting on you, and you can't say, I don't know, and you can't say, let's wait for the Lord. So you act, and you jump ahead. You know how many times I've gone into battle, and I've looked back to see if God was following me? Right? Or I made the plans and then said, by the way, Lord, let me run it by you. The way we sell Christianity today is you're in charge. You make the plans. You make God. You tell him what to do. But that's not how it is with God. And so Saul has his kingdom taken. What a difference between Psalm 145, which we read, and it tells us that God's kingdom never ends. Humans, no matter how powerful we are, we have a shelf life. We have a shelf life. When Saul got ahead of God and became priest and king, he usurped the role that he was given. The only one who was ever called to be priest and king was Jesus Christ. Who never got ahead of God. Even though at any moment he could have called legions down to stop the path. We've been talking about what it means to be in missions, and I've been giving you some missionary stories, so how about another one? How about the story of Eric Little, right? We know about Eric Little uh, from Chariots of Fire, the Scotsman who ran really, really fast, who uh, refused to run on Sunday, but he was so much more. After Little won the gold in the 400, as you know, an event he was not the fastest in. After he won the bronze in the 200 in the 1924 Paris Olympics, he left running at the height of his career. In 1925, he went and did what he knew God had called him to do, and in being obedient to the Lord, he finished up the work his parents had started in China, where he was born. And he became a missionary. From 1925 to 1943, he served in missions. He became an ordained minister. And he moved to Tianjin, then Saocheng, and then eventually interned in Wuxin internment camp in 1943. In the 30s, particularly in 1937, when he was going back and forth between Tietzian and Saocheng, it was in China a very dangerous place to be. He was literally crossing Japanese lines. And the British government told them to pull out, to get to safety. So he let and, and insisted that his wife Florence and their three little girls go to Canada and to be safe. And he, however, did not leave China, but stayed and continued to be a missionary. When he was interned in Wuxin internment camp, he suffered from malnutrition and illness. 
They would later recognize that he had a brain tumor, though they never knew it at the time. And even though he was often without food, he was known as one who shared everything he had. He was one who played games with the boys and the kids, and he was one that people would often seek out to settle disputes. When uh, some very wealthy businessmen who were also in the internment camp had convinced the guards to sneak in rations, Eric Little, with his charm and charisma, convinced them to share with everyone. When Winston Churchill secured his release from the camp in a prisoner exchange, Little gave up his spot for a pregnant woman. And just true to Little's form, he didn't do anything for fame or recognition. In fact, he never told his family that he was given the opportunity to leave. In his last letter to his wife, Lawrence, he does not go into detail about how bad it is. In fact, he just says, I think I'm overworked. February 21, 1945, just two months before that camp was freed, Little died. All of that, and he's known best for being able to run really fast. But you hear that story and you think, my goodness, why not leave when you get the chance? Or better yet, why even go to begin with? He could have been a pastor in Canada or Scotland with some great stories about the Olympics. He gave it up at the height of his career. Why in the world would you do that? Because God does not favor power. He favors humility and obedience. And little, he favored what God favored. If we're going to be the kind of leaders that make a difference, if we're going to truly be missional in this world, then it needs to be different from the world. It means that we have to be willing to be less in the eyes of man so we can be more in the eyes of God. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as you take us to a moment in a time of silence, convict us, speak to us, we pray. Amen. If you'll open your hymn books to hymn number 460, we'll close our service singing all the way, My Savior Leads Me.
reminder, we have prayer up here, if you desire. Let's pray. Lord, guide us now into your world. Christ, remind us of what it means to follow the true king. Allow us to be your hands and feet in this world, we pray. Amen. Thank you.